Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through verse 28. The King James text today reads, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law, remember that today, is manifested or revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets pointed us to this day when the righteousness of God would be revealed. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them, that believe. Can you believe today? Because if you can, you have the ability to stand righteous before God. For there is no difference, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. King Jesus, Savior of lost men, Redeemer, Master, we love you, God, today. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the presence and power of God that we feel in this service today. I'm grateful, God, that your presence, your power, your anointing are able to reach beyond the borders of these walls. And you're able, God, also to touch those that might be watching our service online, those who will later watch online. The preacher of the gospel is worthless without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need the anointing, Master, today. You've given me a powerful, important, scriptural word for the people of God, and I have no ability whatsoever to share it and to do so effectively, except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And today, God, I plead, nay, I beg for that anointing. Touch me that I might touch the hearer. Let the Word of God go forth in power and victory and love that it might accomplish in the hearing that for which you would send it. Touch every ear of every hearer. Let our hearts today be softened and prepared to receive a word from heaven that our soul might be satisfied, that our heart, our spirit might be made right with God and we might leave this service, this message, with a brand new commitment to love you, to live for you, to serve you, to worship you. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Praise God. Amen and amen. That's hard to believe. Have you ever had somebody tell you something and the details of the story were just not quite sounding right to you. 
And either you knew the person they were talking about or you knew the circumstances and the situation. And after they would tell you this thing, you'd look at them and say, you know, that's hard to believe. That, that's hard to believe. I, for me to believe that, I've really got to kind of go against something in me. There's something in me that suggests that what you're telling me just cannot possibly be so. You ever had that happen? I've had that happen on many occasions. My uncle was once married to a woman. And bless her heart, she could tell the tallest tales you ever heard. I mean, her tales would go so high, they made the Empire State Building look like a toy model. She had an uncle who could lift tractor trailer trucks off of people. She had an uncle who could fish and pull up a, a, a blue whale. She had an uncle, and I'm serious, she had this one uncle, she constantly talked about this one uncle, and I mean, she would tell stories and tell tales about all the wonderful, incredible, ridiculous things her uncle could do, and my grandmother, my, her, her mother-in-law, my grandmother, would be sitting off to the side, you know, and I'd see my grandmother kind of look at me through the corner of her eye, and I'd be looking at her. Next thing you know, both of us are fighting a laugh. You know, we're wanting to chuckle. Because both of us knew that that tale was a pile of malarkey. It was, it was ridiculous. The stories she would tell, they were so far beyond reality. And sometimes I'd look at her and I'd say, you know, I said, boy, that's hard to believe. Of course it's hard to believe because it seems to defy all logic. It seems to defy all science. The fundamentals of the gospel of Jesus Christ are more readily believed and embraced than one singular truth. That truth is spoken of in our primary text today. And that truth is that we can do nothing to earn the label righteous. We cannot find perfection or holiness in the law of Moses. These intangibles, meaning righteousness and holiness, only exist within the realms of faith. And yet, there are those in the church today, those who call themselves Christians, who will forever and ever and ever argue this point. How many of us know somebody who without fail, if you're a member of the LGBT community, they will come to you and they're quoting Deuteronomy. Hello now. Oh, but the Bible said, um, excuse me, the law says you need to get your facts straight. Hello now. I've got news for you. You're quoting the law of Moses. You're speaking of the law of Moses. And no man is justified by the law of Moses. The law of Moses did not exist to justify the law of Moses existed to condemn. The whole purpose of the law of Moses was so that the nature of sin could be revealed and humanity could understand that before God there wasn't no hope in hell or heaven either one that they could be righteous in the eyes of God. When you look at the whole of the law, even to this day the Jewish faith understands they say this, as Christians often say but they don't live it, nobody can be perfect. Within the context of Judaism, there is an understanding. Nobody can be perfect, but that doesn't stop anyone from striving for perfection. Even as it is in Christianity, no one is perfect, but that shouldn't stop us from striving toward perfection. One day, God is going to perfect us. We're going to be sinless. We're going to be perfect. We're going to be holy. We're going to be righteous. But until then, God looks at us and sees us as though we had already attained that end. How does he do that? Why does he do that? Because of our faith, not because of our actions. 
Because of our faith, not because we follow some rules. Because of our faith, not because we follow some law, including the law of Moses. The law of Moses only pointed us to guilt. Jesus did not point us to guilt. The Word of God said, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved. The truth of the matter is, the law of Moses pointed us to the verdict guilty. Jesus is the response to the guilty verdict. Hallelujah. In Him we have salvation. In Him we have pardon. In Him we have forgiveness. In Him we have justification. In Him we have redemption. Hallelujah to God. How? How do we have all these things in Him when it's impossible for us to be perfect? By our faith. That's what Paul said. In our primary text today, Romans 3, 19 through verse 28. It's our faith that justifies. The fundamentals of the gospel. What are the fundamentals of the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11 tells us. Paul writes to the church at, at Corinth. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now listen, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, meaning uh, Peter, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then all of the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. So what are the fundamentals of the gospel? The fundamental of, of the gospel are Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world that he was buried and that he rose again. Amen? Well, that's hard to believe. Some people look at you and say, well, that's hard to believe. I, I, I find it hard to believe that any man could come back to life. But when you understand the other aspects of the gospel, that Jesus Christ was God manifest in human form according to the Apostle Paul, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The, Paul, the Apostle Paul said, had they known who Jesus was, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, title which is reserved for God alone. The Word of God tells us Peter preaching in the book of Acts, he said that it was not possible that the grave should contain the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if he were merely a human, it would certainly be possible that he could remain there. What does Peter say? He's saying, hey honey, when you bury God, who is the spirit that's been occupying a body, which is the physical manifestation of himself, it is now possible that you're going to keep that body in the grave. It ain't going to happen. Because that would be the equivalent to your being able to uh, claim victory over God himself, and it don't work that way. So the fundamentals of the gospel, we got people all over the world by the millions who claim today to believe 
Jesus died, that he rose again. Oh, there's all kinds of people in our world who believe that, don't they? Well, yeah, you know, it's not a nearly as hard to believe as you think. If, if you can believe that he is who he is, and you can understand these other things, then believing that he died and rose again, that's not so difficult. But when you try to help people understand, this church ought to be packed from, well, obviously we're under lockdowns right now, so I don't mean at the moment, but when we're having church, we ought to have thousands of people coming to service every day. But we don't. You know why? Because all these people who claim to believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead cannot believe for a minute that an LGBT, uh, LGBT person can be saved and can live for God and can walk in fellowship with Him because righteousness is by faith. They can't believe that. Oh, that's, that's hard to believe. That, that's hard to believe. What do you mean that's hard to believe? Honey, if that isn't so, then you're screwed too. Yes, I know I used the word screwed. I know exactly what I said. If righteousness is not by faith, then honey, heterosexual or otherwise, you're in a pickle. Because no flesh shall be justified by the works of the law. You can keep all the rules you want to keep. You can follow all the law and all the mandates and all the edicts that you want to follow. You can go back into the Old Testament and you can claim that you embrace everything that God said to do. Which, of course, you're lying. You don't. And by the way, I've got bad news for you. The Apostle Paul, New Testament Apostle, said that the minute you try to dip into the law, you become subject to the entirety of the law. If you go into the law and you believe that one single point of that law is necessary to your salvation, you suddenly are cast away from grace. Yeah, I said it. That's what Paul said. He said, there is no more grace. He said, the minute you try to go back into the law, you have negated grace. You've done away with grace. You've gone back and you have joined the number who identify as Jews who are under the law. And guess what? You will be judged in the same manner as they are by God. You will be judged by the law. Oh, you better be wearing the right clothes. You better be wearing your hair the right way, men. Better have your little curly cues. You better have your little wooden block tied to your forehead. Oh, you better have tassels on the bottom of your clothes. You better not be wearing mixed fabrics. You better not be eating lobster. And you better not be eating shrimp. Uh, because the minute you go back into the law, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you... You can stand there and try to argue with me all you want to. Honey, you're arguing with the Word of God. You're arguing with the Apostle Paul. You're not arguing with me. That's what he said. He said, the minute you go into the law and you pull out one point, when you try to make Leviticus applicable to me, because after all, homosexuality is not your issue, it's mine. So you try to let me know that I cannot be saved unless I can somehow or another fix this problem as you see it. Guess what you've just done? You've just put yourself under the entirety of the law. The entirety of it. There is not one point in that law, not one point, that you can ignore. Not a point. See, Christians in the New Testament age, they love to think. And this, let me tell you, this is a joke in the Jewish community. They look at fundamentalist and evangelical Christians, and they look at Christians and they laugh. I've spoken with rabbis about these things, folks. I'm not joking. They look at us and laugh because they say, oh, these people are so funny. They think they can pull one thing out of the law. And they can apply that one thing and they don't understand that the law is a package. You either take the entire package, all 500 and something laws, you got to take the whole thing and you got to live according to that entire package. Because 
God has made no provision anywhere, anyhow, for you to apply one point and ignore the rest. But you try to help people understand that it is by faith that we stand righteous before God. And the answer you will get is, that's hard to believe. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we know the passage so well. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. See, my walk with God, my living for God today is a born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, Jesus-name-baptized believer is a walk of faith. I'm not trying to follow any law. I'm not trying to follow any rules. I'm trying to believe God. I'm trying to take God at His word. He said that whosoever believeth on Him, I'm taking God at His word. He said that faith comes, excuse me, that justification and Righteousness come by faith. Listen to Romans 4, verses 1 through 8. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. You remember Paul said, not of works, lest any man should boast. Here he's saying, if Abraham were justified by works, then he'd be able to boast but not before God. For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So was it Abraham's actions, or was it Abraham's faith? It was Abraham's faith. Faith gives birth to actions, not the other way around. Listen, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Verse 4, Romans 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you're working for it, then when you get rewarded, you're not being rewarded because of grace. You're being rewarded because you're owed. You worked for it, therefore I owe you. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth, listen now, that justifieth the ungodly. Oh my God. Are you hearing me today, saints? Are you understanding that he that justifieth, he that justifieth the ungodly, Woo! He don't even justify the godly. He justifies the ungodly. Hallelujah. Oh, you don't even have to be living up to some set of rules for God to justify you. Hallelujah to God. You don't have to be perfect. You don't even have to be trying for perfection. God justifies the ungodly. Do you know what the term godly means? It means those who are seeking to follow after God's way. See, righteousness means to do right. You can be righteous and be a sinner. You can be a, a person who's not born again, a person who's not a child of God, and live a righteous life because you do right. You don't steal. You don't cheat. You know, you, you treat people the way God would have people be treated. But to be godly means that you go beyond righteous and you try to do those things which God specifically demands and expects 
of His people. That's what makes you godly. And the Word of God says that He justifieth, listen, Whew. but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Yeah, but God says you shouldn't be homosexual. God says you shouldn't be divorced. God says you shouldn't this, you shouldn't that. Oh, but God justifies the ungodly. Even if I were breaking a rule that God has established or something that God desires, God still justifies by faith. Am I telling the truth? That's what the Word of God says. If I believe Him, He still justifies. He still looks upon us and calls us righteous. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Listen, listen, you got you got to listen to the word of God. Too many people glaze over things and, and, and they take what their pastor said. They take what this prophet or this uh, evangelist or this priest or this pope said and they don't listen to the word of God listen faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God but you got to say it right and you got to hear it right verse 6 even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness Without works. So God ascribes to the man that is called blessed. Righteousness without works. Saying, verse 7, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. And listen. And whose sins are covered. Are they still there? Oh, yes, they are. You cover something <laughs> just because it's covered. You remember when you were a kid and something would scare you and you'd pull the blanket over your head because you figured, well, if I can't see it, it can't see me. I'm covered. Hallelujah. But, honey, you were still there. Am I telling the truth? Oh, I can have something ugly in my house. Uh, Tommy can go out and buy some hideous, horrible sculpture that I absolutely hate. And he can put it on the table in the center of the living room and he can just love that sculpture. And when people come to visit, I can put uh, a cloth over that ugly old sculpture. But is that sculpture still there? Certainly it is. But it's covered. But the Word of God said, Blessed is the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. You remember I preached recently on, I've got that covered? Blessed is the man, verse 8, to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Well, wait a minute. Does that mean then that there's no sin there? No, there's sin there. But God will not hold you liable and responsible for it. Why? Because it's covered. He's forgiven it. It's still there. It doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means it's forgiven and it's covered. And your faith is what accounts to God as righteousness. Romans chapter 9, verses 29 through 33. And as Isaiah, Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabbath hath, had left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma and been made like unto Gomorrah. Now y'all know Sodom and Gomorrah. So Isaiah, or Isaiah said, Except God left a seed. In other words, he left enough people out of Israel so that they could regrow. Otherwise, they'd have been like Sodom and Gomorrah and been completely wiped out. Verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness? 
even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness? Wherefore, or how? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. What do they stumble over? Do they stumble over Jesus dying on the cross? Do they stumble over the Lord raising from the dead? Do they stumble over the Lord ascending back in heaven? Nope, that's not where they stumble. They stumble over the fact that righteousness is by faith. It is not born of our actions. It is not born of our conduct. It is not born of following any standard set of rules or doctrines or teachings. Righteousness is of faith. That is what people stumble over. That is what people will forever say. I find that hard to believe. I'm almost done today, I promise. I'm actually doing well because I had a lot of scriptures and long passages at that. Romans chapter 10, verses 4 through 13. Anybody wants to know, this church is a Bible-believing church, honey. When this preacher gets up and preaches, I preach the Word of God. I don't preach opinion. Amen. My little nephew, Michael, when he came to live with us a while back, he used to sit in each, each church service, and he would sit with a pad of paper. He did this on his own. I didn't ask him to. And he would write down every scripture that I mentioned during the course of my message. And at the end of the service, he'd come to me and say, Uncle Chuck, you used 30 passages today. You used 20 passages today. You used this many references today. Because it is imperative that you understand as the hearer that this is the Word of God. Anybody can take a passage here or a passage there and pull it out of context. I want you to understand the word of God said line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. That's how God reveals his truth to his people. So it's imperative that as the Apostle Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We've got to rightly divide. Romans 10, 4 through 13. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, listen, man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation for the scripture saith and we just read it a moment ago as well whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Hallelujah. Lastly, today I want to close with this passage. 2 Peter chapter 1, the first four verses. The Apostle Peter's greeting in his epistle, in his second epistle. He writes, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power, listen, hath given unto us, hath given unto us, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. According to His divine power hath given unto us this gift, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. How do we partake of the divine nature? By rules, by regulations, by laws? No, 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 no. He said, we, t we partake of the divine nature, listen, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, or fleshly, earthly, carnal desires. Children, I've got good news for you today. The thing that is hardest for so many people in the LGBT community to understand and to believe is that they can be saved, they can live for God, they can be a Christian. Now, I do not want anybody to leave this service and say, I can live like a devil and still be saved. That's not what the Word of God teaches. Once you become a child of God, you ought to live like a child of God. Once you become a prince in a kingdom, then you better believe the king is going to expect you to live like a prince. Hello now. You can't keep stealing and robbing and doing the things you might have done when you were a pauper. Amen? No, we live differently, but we don't live differently to earn heaven. We live differently, A, to show our appreciation. B, to be a witness and to be a light in a dark world. No one is going to be attracted to Christ. No one is going to be attracted to the cross of Calvary if everybody that's born again looks identical to them. Why, why, why in the world do I need to repent? Why do I need to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sin? Why do I need to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? Why do I need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved? Uh, there's no difference between that person and me. No, because when we do live in a manner that's pleasing in God's sight, what happens is God begins to pour out His blessing and His favor upon us. How do I know that? Because the Word of God said, Here, Michael, wherever you are, write this passage down. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So as a child of God, we understand there's a better way to live than drinking and drugging. We understand there's a better way to live than being a sexual a deviant and going out and sleeping with everything that has legs. We understand there's a better way to live. We understand that you can commit yourself and commit your life to another human being. And that can be a lifetime commitment and you can be faithful in that relationship. Hello now, am I telling the truth? I want to tell you today, folks, that's hard to believe. I believe Jesus died. I believe He rose again. I believe the gospel. But 
it's hard for me to understand and believe that I don't have to do anything in order to attain righteousness, to stand before God righteous, that my faith is accounted as righteousness. Maybe hard to believe, but it's the truth. Hallelujah. There is no reason today that you cannot live for God. There is no reason today that you cannot serve the Lord and be blessed by Him and experience His blessing and His divine favor in your life. There is no reason in the world today, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, there is no reason in the world today you cannot know Him in a powerful, wonderful way. There is no reason that He will not forgive and pardon. There is no reason today, if you can believe, that God will not impute unto you righteousness. Hallelujah. He'll forgive your sin. He'll cover it. Hallelujah. And He will not hold you accountable for it if you believe this gospel and if you live for Him. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise the Lord.